Okay, folks, good afternoon. Uh, so a few remarks. One is the, the two previous homework assignments are actually over here graded and also the last quiz that we had. Uh, at this point, what I owe you in terms of grading is homework number six, which is the computer simulation file, and homework number seven, which is due today, which is another computer simulation homework. So. These two are going to be graded over, hopefully over like Wednesday and by Thursday uh, you have all of your scores on Blackboard and then you may want to make a decision whether you want to take the final exam or not. As I said, the final exam is not totally comprehensive. There's going to be a list of material that I'm going to provide to you. Just wait until again Thursday and then it is going to be finalized what is going to be and not going to be included in the final exam. Also, I have the sign-up sheet over here. Just don't forget to, to sign it. Um, any questions? I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, what is the grade cutoff for an A? Is it still 90 to 100? Yes, 90 to 100 is an A. That's correct. And then a B is 80 to 90? B is a, yes, a B is from 80 to 90. That's correct. Technically, from 80 to 89.9999. Will you have a review session prior to the final exam? You, usually not. For graduate classes, we don't really do review sessions. Uh, if you have any particular questions, let me know via email, or you can call me, and then we can actually discuss it. Okay, thank you. All right. Any other questions? How do we calculate the power factor of the output? Like, we have a voltage. We uh, sense the output voltage. Okay. But then I personally did not sense the uh, I out. Okay. I did it should just be a register. So. so the question is, how do we calculate the power factor of the output, right? Of what converter? We are looking at the input. Of the input, you said? Yeah, we should be worried about the input. Well, it depends on what topology you're looking at. If it is a rectifier, yes, you've got to look at your input current and look at the total harmonic distortion and power factor. If it is an inverter, then you have to look at the output, the output voltage that you're trying to synthesize and the output current. So your question is about a rectifier, and we are trying to find the power factor of that? The homework, which, oh, the, 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 the most recent homework assignment? There was a block already which calculates power factor. So you, that's, that's all you got to use. You don't have to use anything extra. Because here, your input is totally sinusoidal. So your power factor is kind of like almost just looking at the current, and you can actually find out what the, uh, the, the power factor is. The, the block that was in the simulation file already included a power factor calculator. But it's power factor for, the input. for the input, yeah. For the output, we don't. The output is almost DC, so power factor is not even defined yeah. for the output side. All right, did that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So we are going to continue our discussion about, uh, in general, soft switching, and then in more specific, zero voltage switching and zero current switching. So we kind of last time laid out some motivations. Uh, the first motivation is to protect our switches basically from sudden variations of the voltage or sudden variations of the current of the switch because of, because some of the switches are actually sensitive to it. Our second motivation was to reduce switching losses. So for instance we looked at this uh, simple Bach converter that we have one switch and one diode and as it turns out as we turn the switch on or off there's a switching transition going on and in during that switching transition the voltage and the current of the elements kind of overlap a little bit with each other so every time that you turn these devices on and off you lose a little bit of energy basically and then that energy that you lose times your frequency would be the total amount of energy that you use you lose so second motivation, improve the efficiency. And finally, the third 
motivation is the electromagnetic noise that the, the converter is, uh, you know, you know, sending to the rest of the world. Uh, if we have large dV over dt or di over dt, they are going to couple with parasitic inductors and parasitic capacitors uh, in the system, and so it's going to basically the noise is going to propagate to the other elements in the system. So these are our motivations. Now uh, we are going to what we are going to do today is we are going to actually look at one particular zero voltage switching, and hopefully on Thursday one particular multi-resonant zero voltage switching scheme. Some of you may have seen this in power electronics. Uh, it's almost the same topology, but I'm trying to make it a little bit, cover it a little bit quickly so we would get to something that you guys have not seen before. However, before even starting the discussion, a lot of times in these converters, what happens is uh, you have you have to add a resonating inductor and a resonating capacitor to the network. So a lot of time we are taking advantage of resonance between the elements. So I would like to actually look at a typical resonance circuit and basically write the equations. And then later on we are going to use this very very often. So a typical resonating system is comprised of. Usually we are looking at a resonating inductor. We label it LR and then CR. R, R stands for resonance uh, to basically differentiate these elements from the regular inductor and capacitors that we have in the system. Then let's pretend we have a source of current over here. This source of current is actually not a real source of current. It is actually an inductor. And the inductor is relatively large compared to the resonant period of these two elements. Therefore, during this resonance, the current of this inductor is relatively constant. So we assume it is, an it, it is a source of current. So this is the direction of this current assumed from left to right. The polarity of this capacitor is assumed uh, positive on top, negative in the bottom. And also, uh, we are assuming that V in and I out are constant. OK, they are not necessarily constant, but during the resonance, they are actually assumed to be constant. Uh, let me see if I can uh, make this spin. It is already the thinnest. OK. Also, we need to have some initial conditions for the inductor current and the capacitor voltage. We just label them ILR naught and VCR naught, and then omega naught is the resonance frequency between these two elements, and then Z naught is called the characteristic impedance. Which is this. All right, so given these parameters and these assumptions, you can describe the current that is passing through this resonating inductor to be I out plus the initial value of the inductor current minus I out 
times cosine of So the assumption is this resonating mode has a started at t equal to t naught, okay? So the circuit has been formed at t equal to t naught plus uh, the input voltage minus the initial value of the capacitor voltage over the characteristic impedance times sine of All right. So this is the description for the current of the inductor, and obviously this, in, this description is valid for time values larger than t naught. And also we have almost a similar description for the voltage of the resonating capacitor, which is the input voltage plus the initial value of the cap voltage minus the input voltage times a cosine function plus z naught times um, the initial value of the current minus the output current times the sine of for t greater than t naught. So we're going to use this whenever we have these elements formed in this form that we have one inductor and one capacitor in, a, you know, in the loop with a you know, stiff voltage and then there's some current drawn from the connecting point of the capacitor of, and the inductor. Um, this equations actually hold. Now there are many, many, many resonating converters out there. It's really hard to classify them. Uh, each converter of, of its, you know, uh, is its own class of its own. But generally speaking, you can re you can c categorize resonant converters into three main categories. load resonant in a sense that your load is contributing to the resonance and the resonating components are actually connected uh, around the load. And then resonance switch. Converters in which you have like a resonating inductor and a resonating capacitor or maybe more than one are added around your switches and diodes and then resonant DC link okay so we have these three main categories what we are going to cover because they are more common is the resonant switch converters. And if you are curious about how this whole concept of resonant converters are started, the earliest paper that I was able to find, uh, you know, dates back to 1975. So it's a relatively old topic, as, as old as power electronics has been around. All right. So similar to other stuff that we have done in this class, we always start with a single pole double throw switch. So let's take a look at the single pole double throw switch and try to add these resonating elements around it to convert it to a, let's say, multi-resonant or quasi-resonant single pole double through switch. So our very, you know, early switch was something like this. Okay? And if you wanted to realize this, you would actually use a switch because we were assuming that the control is applied to the top throw and maybe a diode, for instance, down here. For instance, with this, you can build a Bach unidirectional Bach boost or a Bach boost topology. All right. 
so now that we are about to talk about soft switching converters, this particular one that we have been working so far, working with so far, is called a hard switching. Basically, single pole double through switch. It is called hard switching because no soft switching technique has been applied to this to this topology. Now, if you search the literature and try to categorize the soft switching ones, these are the main schematics that you're going to find. For instance, let's say our goal is to achieve zero current switching for the switch, for the active switch. And then this is going to be your new single pole double through switch. So technically what we have done is we have added this resonating inductor in series with the switch and that creates some zero current switching and then we have to add this resonating capacitor in parallel with the diode. So this particular one is called zero current uh, quasi resonant Okay, so zero current is because our, if we analyze this, because of the addition of this resonating inductor in series with the switch, our switch actually works under zero current switching you know, conditions. The reason that it is called quasi-resonant is it's not a multi-resonant. So the difference between a multi-resonant and a quasi-resonant is in a quasi-resonant, there is a certain amount of energy stored in LR and then CR but they are not constantly you know, exchanging that amount of energy. Okay? There is like a, more like a unidirectional flow of energy from LR to CR, or sometimes from CR to LR, and not the opposite way around. And the other thing that you can note over here is, before, when we were looking at, at this very classic hard switching, single pole double through switch, we could not claim that the throw currents are stiff. Only the pole current was a stiff. So technically, this pole current, there was usually an inductor over here, and we would claim that it is a stiff. Now we have added this inductor in series with one of our throws. So actually, our throw current is going to be stiff. So just a notation, throw currents. are stiff. And remember, there is an inductor here anyway, so since we have two inductors connected to the two branches, the third branch is also stiff, which is the third, which is this uh, throw number two, two. Also, if you look back in your hard switching the scheme, we always claim that the throw voltage was a stiff. You always assume there is a source of current or, or a very large capacitor connecting these two throws to each other. But the pole voltage was not stiff. But here we are kind of violating that and that violation is because of adding this um, resonating capacitor in parallel with the diode. So basically we are, we are connecting a kind of a stiff source of voltage which is this capacitor in you know uh, connecting the, the pole to the throw uh, okay hold on T1 T2 so pole voltage which before was not a stiff is a stiff now All right, so these are the main differences. Now, there is another way of actually implementing this circuit, and that would be instead of putting this capacitor from pole, connecting pole number, 
the pole to the throw number two, we can use the same capacitor and connect uh, pole to throw number one. So we still have this resonating inductor over here. We still have the diode, but this time we add this over here. Okay. Either way, you can argue that your pole voltage is a still a stiff. Okay. So this is one way of doing this. Uh, another way would be, okay, we don't want to do zero current switching. What if we want to do zero voltage switching? So let's take a look at the zero voltage switching single pole double throw switch. So this time, because we are trying to provide zero voltage for the active switch, we put this resonating capacitor in parallel with the desired switch. And then we still need a resonating inductor. And then finally, the diode is down here. And this is the pole. Okay, so this is called a zero voltage quasi resonant switch. And as you can see, um, the pole voltage is still not as stiff anymore like the previous case. However, the throw currents are stiff. Okay. Actually, this particular cell is the one that we are about to analyze after I introduce all these categories. So this is what we are going to analyze when it comes to a zero voltage switching, for instance, buck topology. This is, what, this is the cell that we are going to use. Uh, now, just a, just a reminder that we have not talked about how we are going to realize, physically realize this switch. Is this a MOSFET? Is this an IGBT? Is there a diode in parallel with this thing? Is the diode in series with this thing? Is it blocking negative voltages, positive voltages, conducting positive voltages, conducting positive currents, negative currents? Later on, depending on the application, we are going to see how it is going to be actually realized. All right. Another common way of doing this is, uh, still we are in the zero voltage switching domain. As it turns out, zero voltage is more popular and common than zero current switching. But anyway, so we add a resonating capacitor in parallel with the switch. We have the resonating inductor. So far, it's very similar to the previous case. But we also add a second capacitor in parallel with the diode. And then this is our pole. OK. So now we are using two capacitors and one resonating inductor. This particular one is called a zero voltage multi-resonant
And the reason that it is called multi-resonant is because we have several modes of basically resonance. You know, sometimes LR is resonating with CS, sometimes LR is resonating with CD to provide ZVS for both of the switch and the diode. Um, so in this particular one, uh, because of LR, throw currents are stiff. And also because of the two, uh, because of this uh, CD, basically pole voltage is a stiff too. Okay. So this this last one is called uh, the multi-resonant basically cell, ZVS multi-resonant cell. And if you want to do almost similar to this, but instead of having ZVS, having the CS zero current switching, you need one capacitor and two inductors. So let's take a look at this. So this time, we have this switch, and we care about the resonant, uh, the zero current switching of this switch. So I add this uh, inductor in series with that. And then we also care about zero current switching of the diode, so I also add a resonating inductor, a second resonating inductor in, in series with the diode, and then these two guys are going to resonate with this CR. Okay. This last one is not very common because we prefer to have two capacitors and one inductor rather than two inductors and one capacitor, okay? Um, so this particular one is called zero current. Multi-resonant. <laughs> And as you can see, uh, throw currents are stiff. And pole voltage is also stiff. So these are the main you know, ways of, if you have identified a single pole double throw switch in your topology, whatever the topology is, buck boost or buck boost, uh, once you identify that by adding these extra resonating components, you can convert them to a quasi-resonant ZVS or quasi-resonant ZCS or multi-resonant ZCS or multi-resonant ZVS. Um, as I said earlier, usually ZVS is more popular, and the reason is uh, these capacitors that, for instance, you see here, CS and CD, are kind of absorbing the junction capacitance, which is a parasitic capacitance of the devices as well. So whether we like it or not, our devices always have these parasitic capacitances. So all you have to do is just add a little bit of an extra capacitance in parallel with that. So this is like you're, you're trying to absorb the parasitic capacitances in the regular operation of the system. Sometimes if the switching frequency is too high, actually CS and CD are not external capacitors. Those are the resonating, the, the parasitic capacitors of your switches. You don't really actually have to add these external capacitors. They are actually already there as junction capacitors, as parasitic capacitors. The other reason that the bottom, the last one, is not popular is, well, we have two inductors. Inductors are relatively large. They saturate. They, they exhibit some condu extra conduction losses, you know, those, those kind of things. So usually, generally speaking, zero voltage switching is more popular. The other thing, the, the other reason that zero voltage switching is popular is, again, because of these parasitic 
capacitance and uh, the switching losses. Even you turn your switch on and off at Z CS zero current, uh, you still have this parasitic capacitor. Every time that you turn the switch on, this parasitic capacitor is shorted. So there is some energy lost over there. Whereas in ZVS, you're switching at zero voltage. So that means this parasitic capacitor is there, but the voltage of this capacitor is zero. Therefore, you don't really discharge it every time that you turn the switch on. So these are the main reasons that we prefer to do zero voltage switching rather than zero current switch. OK. So now that we have this uh, kind of uh, introductory material, what we are going to do is we are going to apply this actually or use this zero voltage quasi resonant converter in a Bach topology. And then hopefully on Thursday, we are going to use this multi resonant uh, converter in a Bach topology. So you can actually see how they, they function. All right, any questions so far? Yes? Can we control the zero crossing uh, for a diode? Like, uh, we say that, I mean, we would generally like to minimize the losses. So for the switch, it can still be controlled. Right. But for the diode, it is. What do you mean controlling the zero crossing? You're controlling the time or creating zero crossing? We are basically trying to uh, reduce the losses by the instant at which it crosses the zero. We right. don't want the voltage and current to uh, overlap. Right. So yeah, yeah, that's, oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So when we say switch, in general, zero voltage switching, that switch could be also be a diode too. So it could be an active switch, like a transistor, or a passive switch, like a diode. So that's true, yeah. We do that actually uh, over here. We are trying to provide zero voltage transitions for the diode in addition to the zero voltage transitions for the transistor. That's true. Is that your question? Yeah. That's what so okay. we are achieving for the oh, yeah, yeah, for the diode as well. Sometimes diode is more important because of that whole reverse recovery thing, basically. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So let's take a look at this topology. So we are applying this to the Bach converter. <coughs> so this is zero voltage, because as I said, zero voltage is more popular than zero current. And it is a quasi-resonant. So it's actually abbreviated as ZVSQR, Bach converter. OK. So I'm going to just draw it the way we classically draw the Bach topology. So here is our switch. and. If it is a MOSFET, it already has this anti-parallel diode. If it is an IGBT, it doesn't. So I'm just going to put this diode over there as an external element. And then later, we are going to discuss, does it really exist or not? So if we have our switch, we have the diode anti-parallel with the switch, DS. And then we have added this external and maybe partially internal depending on the value of the parasitic capacitance of the switch, CR, resonating cap. Polarities are assumed in this way. And then in series with all of these guys, I add this resonating inductor. And then finally, the rest of the topology. Okay, so we have this. I label this current to be I in, which is the same as the current of the resonating inductor, LR. And uh, these components are usually L and C, but again, in order to differentiate them, I just use LF and CF, like 
filtering components as opposed to resonating components. Okay. All right. First thing that we are going to do, we are going to have a bunch of definitions. And even before that, uh, in the rest of the analysis, we are just going to assume that the switching resonating you know, procedure is very, very quick compared to or short compared to the switching period. Therefore, we always assume that LF, which is our filtering inductor, is replaced with a constant source of current labeled to be I out. OK? So this is usually valid as long as the, the resonant frequency is much larger than the switching frequency. <coughs> OK. All right, now the definitions are some parameters basically the characteristic impedance uh, the resonating frequency in radians per second okay so this is um, R normalized value of the lo or load. So we define the divided actual value of the load by the characteristic impedance. And we call it just R, normalized value for the load. And ultimately, the voltage transfer ratio. We label it M. OK. So remember, this is characteristic impedance. And this is the resonance frequency or resonant frequency. Okay. All right. So all the definitions have been made. Usually, when you're analyzing the Bach, the classic Bach topology, your mode one starts when you turn the switch on at the beginning of the switching period. This one is a little bit different. We always assume. Uh, mode 1 starts when we actually turn the switch off, OK? So I'm just going to write it down here. So switch was on. Diode was off. Kind of a mode 2, classic mode 2. But anyway, before mode 1 starts, this was the situation. Switch was on, and diode was off. And then mode 1 starts when switch is turned off. OK. So now I'm just going to write mode 1. Uh, the duration of this mode is from the beginning of our period to T1. And then switch is just turned off. Diode is also off. So diode hasn't had a chance to turn on. So this is more like a transitional mode. In a classic buck topology, you don't have it. That switch is off and diode are, is off, unless you are operating in discontinuous conduction mode. And um, what was the initial value of the capacitor, the resonating capacitor, the voltage? It is zero, because we just 
opened up the switch. Basically, switch was off before. Switch was on before. Therefore, the capacitor was shorted. So the initial voltage is zero, and also. So before that, so let me draw what was going on in the system before we turned we started mode one. So the switch is on. We have this resonating inductor and diode is off and then we have I out. So I'm just drawing this to get a better sense about the initial conditions. So as you can see, right at the time the mode number one starts and the switch is open, the capacitor right before that was zero. The capacitor voltage was zero. And also the entire amount of I out is passing through LR. That means I LR at zero is I out, basically. So these are the initial conditions. All right. So now we have opened up the switch. So switch is not going to conduct anymore. The capacitor is not going to be bypassed anymore. So now the capacitor is actually on the conduction path of I out. And then we have to make a decision whether or not this diode is on or off. And it turns out to be actually off. Okay. So technically, we have this cap, the resonating cap, and it is being charged with uh, this I out current. So the voltage of this cap starts growing from zero, which is the initial value, to a uh, you know positive value. So VCR. Something like this, OK? And um, so what, now we've got to make a decision. What happens to the diode? Is the diode really off or not? So all, all we've got to do is just look at the voltage of the diode. So I'm just going to write KVL on the loop on the left-hand side. Uh, it gives me this. Again here, I'm assuming that I out is constant. Therefore, there is no voltage drop on the inductor. So if you look at KVL around this loop, all you see is the source, the voltage drop on the resonating capacitor, and the voltage drop on the diode. So, OK? So as it turns out, this is negative. So we are actually applying a negative voltage on the diode. The diode is not actually on yet, so it makes sense. OK? And if you are curious about what happens at the end of this mode, at the end of this mode, this VD actually, so if, if I draw VD, let me draw it this way. So at the very beginning, the entire input voltage in a reverse direction is applied across VD. But as VCR grows, VD actually gets closer and closer to 0. And the end of this mode is when VD tends to get positive, And the diode actually starts the conduction. So that's the end of this, this mode. All right. Now let me draw some figures. And I'm going to come back here. Uh, so. Let me just draw them under each other. Yes. Uh, what about the inductor voltage in this? We assume that the inductor, vo the resonating inductor voltage, this voltage. Yeah. We assume that this is almost zero. 
The reason is I out is almost constant. And LR is a very small inductor. So L D, uh, DI over DT is very uh, small, so we kind of neglect it. So in this mode, in terms of the input current, nothing exciting is happening. The inductor current on the output side, which we label to be I out, is actually flowing through it. Uh, VCR is growing. Okay, this is this equation over here. Uh, and it grows to Vn. That means diode voltage grows to zero, and then the next mode starts. What about the current of the diode? Um, the diode is off, so the current of the diode is zero. OK. And what about the voltage of the diode? Actually, I, I drew it earlier, but anyway, let me draw it again. It is starting at negative Vn and starts actually increasing. All right. So uh, actually, no resonance is occurring right now because actually, um, the the only thing that is happening is the the capacitor is being charged by I out. Okay. Mode number two starts when. Uh, either you can argue VCR approaches Vn or Vd approaches zero, either way. Um, so they are in the same loop anyway. So mode number two starts. So switch is still off. However, because the voltage of the diode gets to zero and tends to get positive, now the diode is actually turning on. Uh, so mode two starts when when D turns on. Okay. Uh, what about initial conditions? Referring to the figure, the resonating capacitor's voltage is Vn, and ILR is I out. So these are the initial conditions that we need. Now, what about the diagram? OK, the circuit is going to look like this. So now the diode is on, ideal diode, shorted. And the entire amount of I out is passing through the diode. So this gives us a chance to LR and CR to resonate with each other. And I'm just going to keep an eye on this diode over here. OK. So this is what we have now. So if you look at this diagram, it is actually, we can write the equations using the very general, typical resonance circuit that we analyzed earlier. So uh, wait a minute. Uh, it's a little bit different, actually. Uh, let me see. 
Yeah, it's actually the same. It's actually the same system, assuming that I out is zero. Okay. So if I remove this, what we have is we have one inductor precharged to a certain voltage. One, I'm sorry, one inductor precharged to a certain current, and one capacitor precharged to a certain voltage, and they are placed in a loop with a source of voltage. If you look at what's happening here, it's actually the same thing. We have an initial value for the inductor current, we have an initial value for the capacitor voltage, and they are placed in a loop with an input voltage. I out doesn't really matter because I out, the entire I out is actually flowing through this diode. So I out actually is not going to interfere with this resonance at all. Okay, so I out is not going to appear in our equations. Okay. Uh, so writing the equations using these two general equations that we have over here, ILR and VCR. Remember, I out is not there, so I'm not going to consider it. And we end up with these two equations. Okay, I just said IAD does not appear, but IAD appears because IAD here is the initial value of ILR, basically. So our equations are a little bit simpler. In one of them, only a cosine term appears. In the other one, only a sine term appears. If you go all the way up, you're going to see why. For instance, in the, in the current waveform, in the top equation, only the cosine term appears. First of all, there is no I out, so this is actually 0. And this is zero because the initial value of the capacitor voltage equals V in. So they are subtracted from each other, they give you zero. So all, all you get is just a cosine term. In the bottom one, V in is there, uh, the sine term is there, and again, these two are actually equal with each other, so the cosine term b b disappears in the voltage equation, okay? So that's why our equations are a little bit simpler. All right. So this is what's happening. So let me draw them. So the inductor current is following a cosine, basically, explanation. So it's actually going to follow a cosine pattern. OK. Drawing is going to get a little bit tricky. Let me write in a different way. So let me draw the entire cosine. We don't need the entire thing. OK, and then it is going to follow this up to a certain point, And we are going to decide where that point is. The, uh, the capacitor voltage follows a sine pattern in addition to an initial value of Vn. So. So this is the initial value. It is trying to follow this. And it follows it like this, up to this point. OK? So if you want to be super accurate, this peak minimum value of cosine should happen at the same time that the they are 90 degrees out of phase from each other. So when one of them is at the maximum minimum, the other one is crossing 0, basically. Uh, OK, so this actually goes on a little bit longer. OK, something like this. All right, um, so when does this mode end? 
this mode ends when the voltage of the resonating capacitor gets back to zero. So that's an ideal time for us to do something with the switch, basically, because the voltage of the switch is basically zero. Or you can argue that because this diode is there, this voltage is not even allowed to get to zero, to, to get to the negative territory. So as soon as this voltage tends to get zero or negative, the diode turns on. So let me just write it down here. So you can argue there is a diode, there is not a diode. If there is a diode, this is the scenario. If the diode is not there, what do I mean by if, by if the diode is not there? We have intentionally made our switch a like a unidirectional switch in terms of conduction or something like, oops, sorry. Sometimes we can actually add an extra diode over there. That means there is no way that the current is going to flow back to the switch, OK? But here, my assumption is we haven't done so. So there is a diode, like a body diode, in parallel with our switch at any given time, OK? So DS turns on. at. at the end of this mode, which is labeled to be T2, when is 0. OK. So we have a resonance going on. The, the voltage across this resonating capacitor, which happens to be the voltage of the switch and the S, it starts from Vn, goes to a peak, comes back to zero, and then the mode finishes, basically. All right. So how long, what is the length of this mode? So technically, if you are curious about how long this resonance is going to last, uh, it would be something like this. So technically, you have to say, OK, this is 0, and then solve it for t2 minus t1, which gives you an equation like this, OK? OK. Uh, any questions so far? So this is our actually only resonating mode, basically. Um, there is one condition for this resonance to be successful and to bring back the voltage of the switch to zero. And that is, this peak should be larger than this DC bias. OK? If the peak is a smaller than that, what's going to happen is going to happen something like this. So let's say this is your DC bias, and the peak is something like this, and this is zero. It never returns to zero, OK? Because the peak is a smaller than this. Here, as you can see, the peak is a smaller than the DC bias. We have an expression for the peak. We have an expression for the DC bias. Let's take a look at them. Let's try to compare them. So, um, OK. So. <clears throat> my peak is basically this, I out times Zn, or the amplitude of the resonance. This should be greater than the DC bias, which is Vn. OK? Or you can argue this is equivalent to saying Zn, the characteristic impedance, should be larger than V in over I out. OK. Which, with some manipulation, is the same as the load resistance divided by M, which was the, uh, basically, voltage transfer ratio of the system. OK. 
or you can again manipulate this and say M which is the voltage transfer ratio of the converter should be greater than R and R was the normalized value of the load RL over Z out or Z not okay so this is the main condition so this is the condition for for VCR to come back to zero Remember, our whole goal is to provide ZVS, zero voltage switching, meaning that our voltage should come back to zero. So in order to achieve ZVS, we've got to make sure, for instance, M, the voltage gain is larger than R. So the designer should actually deal with these numbers and pick the right value of the load and the characteristic impedance and stuff like that so that this condition is satisfied. OK. Any questions so far? Yes. If this condition is not satisfied, it doesn't mean the circuit fails. It just means you don't have zero volt crossing. This the circuit does not fail. You're right. Um, it doesn't have zero voltage crossing. However, then you can argue that even in that case, you can monitor this voltage, and when it gets to its minimum value, for instance, turn the switch on. So you have, it's called z near zero voltage switching instead of an absolute zero voltage switching. Okay. Uh, other questions? Okay. So, so this is the end of this mode. We've got to move on to the next mode, but we have to, before we get to the next mode, look at the final conditions of this mode because those are the initial conditions of the, of the next mode. So all I care about is what was the numerical or expression, numerical value or expression for ILR at the end of this mode. So actually, I have to find it. So remember, this is the end of this mode. This is T2. OK, so ILR at the end of this mode. So all I have to do is basically Use this equation, and instead of T, which is our regular parameter minus T1, I should just place in the argument T2 minus T1. So once I do so, I will end up with I out times cosine of omega n times, uh, OK, T2 minus T1. which turns out to be negative anyway, OK? So I add is in the negative territories, OK? So I find basically T2 minus T1 up here, and then plug it in over there to find the numerical value for ILR at the end of this mode. OK, so now we are walking to the third mode. So, and by the way, uh, please note that this was almost a normal mode compared to the classic buck converter. In a classic buck converter, we had a mode, which was mode two, where we had the switch was on and the diode was, uh, I'm sorry, the switch was off and diode was on. Here we have the same mode because switch is off and the diode is on, however, the duration of this mode is out of our hands. We cannot make this mode longer or shorter. It is determined by the resonance parameters. Okay, once we select LR and CR and I out, we can't really say, okay, right now I want to make this mode a little bit longer. So we don't have any direct control over the duration of this mode. So just keep that in mind. All right, so third mode. Um, The anti-parallel diode is on. The regular diode is on, which is more like a transitional mode. We don't really have this in a regular buck. And basically, 
because the diode is on, the, the voltage drop across the switch is almost zero. That means this is the best time to send a command to turn this switch on. Okay, but we cannot wait forever. So the DS is on, so almost no voltage drop on the switch. Uh, but we cannot wait forever because this DS is going to be on as long as our current is negative. Okay, so as long as this current is negative, DS is on, that's the best time to turn the switch on. Okay, so I'm just going to label this to, to be T2 prime. And please remember this green thing that I drew is not following the cosine anymore. It's actually a straight line. I'm going to actually write the equation for it. So if I really want to zoom in, if I zoom in, this is what I'm going to get. So I have a cosine that starts from here, ends here, and this is a straight line. It's not following the cosine anymore. So in terms of our schematic, DS is on, so the whole thing is shorted. And then we have LR. And then diode is on too. And I out. So there is no resonance going on here because we only got LR left. CR is shorted by the diode. And uh, this voltage is 0. And a description for ILR would be a slope of voltage over L times time plus the initial value of the current, which was, we found it at the end of this previous mode, which was I out here. I out times cosine of something. So this portion is just the initial conditions. OK. Uh, so what's happening in this mode is let me pick green this current is actually linearly rising from a negative a starting point of a negative value all the way, it's going to continue until it gets to I, um, I in or I L R. Let me just right, label it here. I out. I out basically. Okay, and that is when your diode turns off, because if it doesn't turn off, and if if this current gets even larger than I out, that means the diode should be supporting a conduction of a negative current impossible. Therefore, the diode turns off, basically. So this is the end of this mode, T3. So this mode starts from T2, ends at T3. At T2, the current is negative. Therefore, DS is on. At T3, the current is positive. So therefore, before the negative portion of the current is over, we should have turned our switch on, basically. So this short circuit that I have provided here is initially provided by DS. But before the current tends to get positive, so initially the current is in this direction. And DS is on. But we have to turn the switch on during that time, because then in the end, we won't have a 
the conduction in the opposite direction, okay? So this is DS and this is S. But I just drew it as a short circuit because it doesn't matter which one is on, they are both ideal components, assumed to be ideal components, therefore they are like a short circuit. Okay. So, um, so that's it. Other waveforms, nothing exciting is happening. For instance, uh, either DS is on or the switch is on. Therefore, in both cases, VCR is shorted, zero. Um, I didn't draw ID, by the way, for the previous case, T2. Okay, it's like a it's like a cosine form, and then it peaks at two i out. And the diode was on, therefore shorted until T three. The diode is on, but all of a sudden at the end of this mode it actually turns off. Uh, ID kind of ramps down. So if you look at in between T2 and T3, which is the third mode, ID plus ILR, they're both a straight lines, should give you I out. Okay, something like that. And by the way, if you really zoom in to ID, it is something like this. Let me try to draw it a better way. It starts from here, goes to a peak, and then a little bit continues, and that is T2. And then goes down like a straight line. OK, so that peak value is not happening at T2. Okay, so how long is this mode? This mode is T3 minus T2 is just the last equation that I have on the, on the screen should equal to zero. It, it should be equated to I, I out, and I get this expression. Okay, so this is the duration of this mode. Any questions? So this mode is not a resonating mode. All that is happening is um, the current of ILR, this current basically, is a starting from a negative value and rising until it tends to get larger than I out. And uh, at that point, the di diode is going to turn off basically. Okay. Okay, last mode, mode four. So diode just turned off at the end of the third mode, so diode is off. Switch is on, kind of like the first mode in a classic buck converter. Switch on, diode off. All right? Now, the duration of this mode is in our hands. We can make this mode longer and shorter because there is no resonance going on. Uh, so technically, the circuit diagram would be switch is on, diode is off. Something like this. And LR is not really in the picture because almost a constant current passing through LR. So we can control the duration of this mode. OK. 
Okay, so among these three modes that we looked at, three of them are determined by the system, okay? One of them was determined by a resonance situation, the other two, if the diode current tends to get negative or the switch voltage tends to get negative, but the only mode that we can make shorter or longer is actually this mode, which is a weird case because in the, uh, that means by changing the length of this mode, we have to change the switching frequency, basically. All right. So we're going to continue on this on, on Thursday. Hopefully by Thursday, I have all of your homework assignments, the, the, most, the, the two most recent ones, also graded. All right.